you've just been hearing and seeing, aside from the famous overture from The Marriage of Figaro, is one of the world's simplest and, in my opinion, nicest sounding audio compressors in action. It's maybe hard to believe upon initial listening, but it's actually compressing the dynamic range of the original source by over 10 decibels in this instance. To prove it, here's the original uncompressed sample adjusted for the same average level. As you can see, it has built-in level indicators, two independent channels, and no external power source other than the amplified input drive signal. It also has a highly natural and unobtrusive compression characteristic due to its inherent true RMS level detection, smooth knee, and attack release time constants. If you've ever wanted an analog compressor with these sorts of features, then you'd be looking at a cost of well over £200, if not more. In many cases, the distortion and particularly the noise performance compared to the little box you can see here will be an order of magnitude worse, but more on that later. You can put this little unit together in less than an hour if you have the parts for it lying around, like I did. If not, then there are absolutely no magic or esoteric components involved that can't be picked up from any respectable electronic supplier. So firstly, you'll need a suitable amplifier to drive the compressor. As it's passive, the compressor needs quite a high input level of 7.5 volts RMS to drive the compressor to its maximum input level at a considerable drive current. What we're looking for here is any power amplifier that's capable of driving 15 watts or more into 8 ohms and doesn't use a Class D topology. The amplifier that I'm using in this instance is this lockdown issue Technics SU3050. It's certainly not the best amplifier in the world, and with only 15 watts output into 8 ohms, it sails very close to the winds of overload, but just about manages in this instance. I'm currently in the process of restoring this lovely SA200 receiver, but I'm waiting for some more capacitors to arrive in the post. The most important thing is that the negative speaker terminal of the power amplifier is referenced to earth. It's easy to check this with a multimeter. Simply place one probe on the negative speaker terminal and place the other onto a bare metal part of the chassis outside of the RCA connectors or, if you have one, a turntable grounding post. As long as you have continuity between the two, then the amplifier will be suitable. This will be the case for most older amplifiers and high quality integrated amplifiers. If you don't have continuity or see a resistance of over 10 ohms or so on the meter, then your amplifier is probably using a BTL or bridge tied load output. This means that the negative terminal voltage will not be connected to ground, but another amplifier output so the two can work in tandem to drive the load. If you use such an amplifier with this compressor, then you'll probably end up short-circuiting the amplifier output to ground via the line input of whatever you connect the compressor to, which will either blow up the amplifier's output stage, the line input grounding, or both. Luckily, the vast majority of integrated amplifiers that you'll come across will fulfil these requirements. Let's move on to the compressor itself. Looking at the box, you might imagine that there's some complicated circuitry lurking inside, although I'm sure a few people have already worked out what's going on here already. Taking the bottom panel of the box off and looking inside, there's surprisingly little to see. In fact, there are only two components that weren't visible from the outside of the unit, being these two chunky looking resistors. So how does it work? The schematic below shows one of the two identical channels. The first component the drive signal from the power amplifier PA plus hits, is filament lamp LS1. The drive current then returns to the power amplifier, PA-, through resistor R1. 
LS1 and R1 make up an L-pad attenuator, which is then connected to another high Im impedance attenuator, potentiometer R2. R2 allows the output level to be adjusted so as not to overload whatever the compressor might be connected to downstream. That's all very well, but what actually causes the compression effect instead of just fixed attenuation? It's due to the temperature coefficient of the tungsten filaments inside the lamp. With a very low level signal of 500 millivolts or so, the resistance of the filament lamp is just under 5 ohms, so the attenuation of the network is only 8 decibels. However, as the input voltage increases up to its maximum level of 7 volts RMS, the filament starts to dissipate power and heats up, emitting visible light. As the temperature of the filament increases dramatically from the ambient temperature of about 21 degrees Celsius to 2500 degrees Celsius, so does its resistance. By the time it reaches 2500 degrees at 7 volts RMS, the resistance has now risen from 5 ohms to 33 ohms. This corresponds to an attenuation of 21 decibels as opposed to 8 decibels in our attenuation network, yielding a variation in gain of 13 decibels. As the temperature of the filament, and hence the attenuation of the compressor, is directly proportional to the RMS power dissipated across it, the compressor operates in true RMS mode, which closely matches the ear's perception of sound and results in a very natural characteristic. A great many other compressors use averaging, which quickly becomes inaccurate when peaky waveforms are present, such as with this recorded speech waveform from the past sentence shown here. Unfortunately, due to being in the middle of a move, I can only test the compressor through my audio interface, Audacity, and 45-year-old amplifier. Fortunately, these clandestine means are just enough to demonstrate the compressor's behaviour. A quick test with a rising amplitude 1 kHz sine wave from 0 to 7 volts RMS over 10 seconds shows the input to output level characteristic of the compressor. This looks almost ideal to my eyes, although you may spot an ever so slight dip in the curve around the 2 second mark. From 0 to 1 seconds, you can see the constant rise of the test signal before the action of the compressor begins. This is followed by, in my opinion, a lovely soft knee from 1 to 2 seconds. You can see how the gain reduction increases after this point, as the rate of rise is far less steep than it was from 0 to 1 seconds. This, fortuitously, is an ideal characteristic that we would want to see in a high quality compressor. Testing the attack time with a 7 volts RMS 1 kHz tone, we can also see that the compressor takes about 80 milliseconds to attenuate the input signal to within a decibel of its fullest extent. This also sounds very good indeed subjectively. If the attack time was any shorter, we would be running the risk of increased distortion at low frequencies, but more on that later. The release characteristic with the same tone suddenly stepped down to 700 millivolts shows that the release time is roughly one second for the level to be within a decibel of its static amplitude. These attack and release times are surprisingly close to the 1 to 10 ratio that you might find in a commercial compressor in normal use, again resulting in a very natural characteristic. Now for the distortion tests. You might think that the compressor would have a fairly high level of distortion, as the resistance of the lamp filaments is, after all, non-linear. The key here, though, is that the thermal inertia of the filaments is high enough to keep this non-linearity from raising its ugly head within the audio band. Here's a frequency plot showing a steady 1 kHz tone at 7 volts RMS. The spectrogram shows a peak at 1 kHz, 2 kHz and 3 kHz. These are the only harmonics showing on the spectrogram which would seem to indicate that the distortion mechanisms are entirely low order, which is to be expected if they are thermal in origin. I know that the second harmonic distortion at 2 kHz is coming from the power amplifier due to the way the input stage is configured in its IC power amplifier stages, 
using a resistor and a xenodiode instead of a proper constant current source for the input tail loading. I originally bought this amplifier as I was intrigued by the fact that it used IC power amplifiers as early as 1975. There is of course a penalty to pay in terms of performance, as they weren't exactly a refined technology, with markedly worse linearity and performance than their discrete forebearers, but I think it's an interesting piece of history. As the operation of the circuit is symmetrical, in that the heating is even regardless of the polarity of the input voltage, it's safe to assume it does not produce any even order distortion, which is only created through asymmetrical nonlinearity. Going back to the spectrogram, we can estimate the THD at 0.07%, based on the assumption that the distortion is entirely third harmonic. This is very good indeed, when compared to a good number of VCA, JFET, and even optical compressors out there. There's still the question of how badly the distortion performance deteriorates as frequency decreases. Reducing the frequency of the test signal by a factor of 10 to 100 Hz shows that the third harmonic has now almost doubled to a more intimidating 0.13%, which I still think is excellent considering all factors. Taking this further still, all the way down to 20 Hz, the distortion starts rising at an exponential rate, resulting in a total of 1.6%. A fifth harmonic at 100 Hz is also clearly visible, which further bolsters the assumption that the distortion is generated thermally and symmetrically. This is quite an extreme example, as I've yet to encounter 20 Hz at full level in the real world, with the exception of some quite heroically mismatched turntable arm and cartridge resonances. In any case, 99% of loudspeakers would be exceeding their excursion long before you reached 1% distortion at 20 Hz with this compressor. If you're still watching, you might be interested in building this to test it out for yourself. While you can get similar results from a wide variety of lamps, I found that 6 volt lamps with a current rating of 100 to 200 milliamps works best, in conjunction with a loading resistor value slightly lower than the lamp's cold DC resistance. Using lower powered lamps resulted in a less effective compression characteristic, with less attenuation at maximum, most likely due to the fact that the filaments of lower powered bulbs don't tend to get as hot. You could use a higher voltage lamp with a higher power rating, such as a 12 volt 10 watt halogen bulb, but that would require over 10 times the amplifier power, and your tail resistor would have to be reduced to no more than an ohm, which would mean that your amplifier would have to be happy driving a 2 ohm load as well. Most won't. It might also be the case that the attack and release times will be considerably longer. I would strongly recommend using lamp holders for the bulbs, as although I haven't managed to blow them up yet, there's every possibility of doing so, as most amplifiers are more than capable of supplying the power to blow the filaments. It also allowed me to stick them on the face of the enclosure where they can function as useful level indicators, providing a warning that I might be pushing things a little too hard when they become excessively bright. The enclosure itself is of little importance. As you can see, I've used an inexpensive plastic one that I had lying around. It certainly won't hurt to use a metal enclosure at all, but seeing as the internal impedances are so low, there's very little risk of electrostatically coupled noise, so the benefits of shielding seem to be fairly negligible. It's always a good idea to keep wiring as short as possible though. I've taken care that the highest impedance point in the circuit, the wiper of the potentiometer that connects to the RCA center pins, is kept as short as possible by placing the two points as physically close to each other as is practical. Although the loading resistors shown in the unit I've made are hefty 2 watt types, I've only used them because they were the only 3.3 ohm resistors that I had lying around. For normal use you could probably get away with using quarter watt types. Theoretically they should be rated for half a watt minimum for constant use at maximum level, but seeing as the average power dissipated across the resistors with a real world audio signal, instead of a 7 volt sine wave will result in a dissipation around the 100 milliwatt mark, 
it's not exactly a pressing issue. I would have been happy using quarter watt parts if I only had those lying around at the time. The attenuator R2 is not strictly necessary if the compressor is going to be connected to an input that can handle more than 4 volts peak to peak, such as an audio interface which can typically accept up to 5 volts peak to peak before overload occurs. If you wish to omit it, then I would recommend reducing R1 to 2.2 ohms as shown below, so as to increase the overload margin by 3 decibels, as it does come very close to full scale with the attenuator set all the way up. With some percussive material, you will almost certainly risk clipping. So far I've only shown unbalanced outputs, which could lead to ground loop issues between the two stages connected on either end of the compressor. Although it looks to be fundamentally unbalanced in operation, it's perfectly possible to include an output which takes advantage of the common mode noise cancellation benefits that balanced signalling can provide. The circuit shown below uses what's called impedance balancing, where, although the audio signal is only connected to the hot side, an almost identical impedance, in this case 220 ohms, referenced directly to the signal source's ground, is connected to the cold side. This allows a balanced input to reject common mode interference, such as ground loops and electrostatic coupling, which will present themselves equally on the electrically identical hot and cold sides. It's often an overlooked fact that it's not actually a requirement for the signal itself to be fully balanced. Only the line impedance characteristics need to be for the noise rejection benefits of balancing to be realized. In many cases where full output swing is not required, a fully balanced output can be significantly noisier than an impedance balanced one due to the noise of the extra inverting stage, but that's another topic for another day. As a balanced input will be only half as sensitive as with an unbalanced one in this configuration, R1 can be returned to 3.3 ohms without a risk of peak clipping. Due to the requirement for hot and cold impedance to be identical, it is not possible to use an attenuator in this configuration. As the power amplifier side of the circuit is unbalanced and hence more susceptible to ground currents, it's a good idea to prioritise shortening any wiring on this side of the circuit. If you still run into problems with ground loops, you should be able to eliminate these completely by inserting a 10 ohm quarter watt resistor in series with the balanced ground path. As far as wiring goes, you can use pretty much any two core cable you have lying around for this build. I chose this high quality oxygen free copper quantum infused and cryogenically treated performance speaker cable from Synergistic Research that you can see here, but I'm sure it would work just fine with two core mains cable. You can also use any connectors you have lying around in your bits box, such as these nickel plated binding posts and rather dodgy AliExpress brass pretending to be gold, but hey, I suppose it's at least not steel RCA connectors. A quick afternote that I'd like to add is that although the compressor appears to be optical in that it emits light like the optically coupled filament lamp and LDR compressor shown here, its action is actually thermal so the correct technical name for it would be a thermal compressor. That's all I have to offer for the moment. If I make any further developments, I'll post an update, but given how surprisingly well the characteristics of the components I've had lying around match ideal characteristics, it's unlikely that there'll be any further improvement to be made with further experimentation, on my part at least. If you found this video useful or entertaining, then you might want to consider keeping an eye on this channel, as I'll be publishing some more videos based on little known audio hacks over the next few weeks. If there's anything that you think that I've missed or would like me to comment on further, then let me know in the comments and I'll be right on it. In any case, thanks for watching and if you're so inclined, happy building.